and that's it from the waiting room, Joel. So take it okay. away. Great. Welcome, everyone. We'll get started. Uh, so welcome to this uh, Unpacking the Exhibition event, support of our fall exhibition titled As Is, Beauty in the Body in Contemporary Art, which is now on view in the GVSU Art Gallery in the Haas Center for Performing Arts um, on our Allendale campus. If you haven't seen the show yet, you can visit our website where you'll find related resources. Um, Nathan can drop a link in there uh, so you can follow that. We hope you can see the exhibition in person during our regular gallery hours. It's up through Friday, November 4. Um, boy, that's coming quickly. It feels like yesterday that we just opened the exhibit. Uh, you can find hours and visitor information on the website, along with learning resources and a recommended reading list from our university libraries. If this is your first art gallery event, here's a little more info about what we do. The GVSU Art Gallery serves the entire university community across all campuses. Grand Valley State University holds the second largest collection uh, of art in the state of Michigan. Approximately half of the GVSU collection is on public display, actively integrated throughout university buildings, curated into exhibitions hosted at our galleries. The entire collection is available through our online database powered by Collective Access, allowing GVSU faculty, staff, students, and researchers from around the world to access information pertaining to every artwork and artist in our collection. Uh, we believe that visual art viewing experiences have the power to spark conversations, action, and reflection on core themes of social justice, human rights, and empathy that align with the university's philosophy of liberal education. And today we're thrilled to welcome two artists from the exhibition, as is Beauty in the Body of Contemporary Art, Melissa Cook Benson and Maria Tomasula. Uh, the intent of this conversation is twofold. First, to illuminate the artist's works and their process, and second, to put the work in context and begin a deeper conversation about how bodies are created, presented, and perceived in art. Uh, each artist will spend about 10 to 15 minutes, uh, starting first with their piece in the exhibition. You can see a slide up here from the exhibition, so they'll start with their work that's in the exhibition, and then they'll move on to discuss other works and themes that they explore in their practice. Following these presentations, um, I'll have a question, begin a conversation, and uh, then we'll welcome in any additional audience questions and comments for the remainder of the program. So before I introduce the guests, I'd like to provide some information about the show just briefly. Here's another slide of the uh, exhibit. Uh, this exhibition is selected from a private collection in Chicago. It brings together 20 artists from the last 25 years who actively engage the body in its changing role through their work. Drawing on historical and progressive approaches to figuration, they celebrate the body as a source of inspiration and challenge traditional notions of beauty and representation. The images and renderings of bodies in this exhibition are not neutral. They reveal each artist's motives, beliefs, and passions, and raise questions about the representation of the human form in a world still saturated with idealized images of the body. More importantly, they provide meaning and help us see ourselves and how we see others within a culture that's increasingly conscious of age, race, gender, and status. Uh, and I'd also like to take a moment to thank our lenders, uh, Michael McVicker and Brian Westfall, who graciously opened their home and their collection to us. Uh, it's really been a pleasure to work with you and to share your part of this collection with our community. Uh, Michael and Brian are on this call, so thanks, hi to both of you, and thanks for joining us, and thanks for sharing. Uh, just quickly, a brief introduction to our two artists. Uh, I'm pleased that we really have two artists from this exhibition who work in very different mediums, styles, and approaches, but are equally attentive to realism and meaning. And there are several traditional approaches to the human figure seen in this exhibition, uh, but today we'll be talking with Maria Tomasula, whose paintings um, are on the, the painting of hers is on the left side here. Um, are, her paintings are very highly metaphoric using objects and elements of the body. Anna Melissa Benson, uh, whose image is on the right, whose drawings are charged with memory and focus on her own body, which often becomes a shared space with the viewer. Uh, briefly, Melissa Cook Benson received her MFA from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, specializing in powdered graphite on paper. Her work investigates the relationship between photography, performance, and drawing and portraiture. Cook is represented by Copland Del Rio in Seattle, Washington, her drawings have been exhibited at and collected by many institutions across the country, 
and her work has been featured in New American Painting, Fine Art Connoisseur, High Fructose, Drawing Magazine, and the Huffington Post, to name a few. She lives and works in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, Anna Maria Tomasulo is born in East Chicago, Indiana, and is an act is part of an active scene at the Chicago Art uh, in Chicago. She received her um, BFA from the University of Illinois at Chicago, and then continued her education at Northwestern University, where she earned an MFA. MFA. She's currently professor of art at the University of Notre Dame. Her solo exhibitions include shows at Form Gallery in New York and Los Angeles, the Indianapolis Museum of Art, Indianapolis, and at the National Museum of Mexican Art, Chicago. With striking color and theatrical compositions, Tomasula's artwork is influenced by the aesthetic of the Mexican diaspora, especially of altar painting, as well as by new materialist writers. As an artist, she seeks to create images that give visual form to the elusive sensation of being, of embodiment, and of relation with the world. So thank you both. We're excited to have you. And I am going to turn things over to Maria first for her to talk uh, about first the piece that's in the show, Royalty, uh, and then uh, other pieces uh, that she's worked on in her career. Maria. OK, thanks so much. Thanks uh, for the invitation. And thanks for everybody being here. Um, so I, I'm going to mostly talk about sorts of motivations and, and ideas, you know, themes and those kinds of things. Um, of, often in giving talks, uh, art students in particular are interested in technical stuff. I'll be happy to answer those questions. But um, I myself will just talk about some of this, you know, some of the stuff I was thinking about when I was making these paintings. Uh, so uh, um, as Joel said, this is the painting in in the show, and I mean, obviously, it's it's a skull. It, it's not. It, you know, I should say, after all that beautiful language and thinking so carefully about bodies, here's the first image, and there's no body in it. Um, but but there's a skull, so a body is implied. Um, so you have this skull, and then I have it surrounded in a kind of crown or or halo of um, beautiful objects from nature, um, you know, fruits, uh, flowers, and so on. Uh, what, al although uh, the way I work, I often don't know uh, what I'm going to do or what the painting is going to end up like. Um, I often do know that I want to take things that are sometimes thought of as binaries and try to create an image where um, the sense one gets is of simultaneity. So he, here, the skull often associated with death, the, the idea of death um, is part of an image that has a, a, again, a halo or a crown of objects that seem like they're teeming with light, they're, they're glistening, they're, they're, um, they're at the height of their bloom and, and so on. Um, so what, what I'm hoping uh, comes across, or, or at least the idea that I was working with, again, was of sim simultaneity, the way, for me, the skull is, isn't uh, inert matter. To, for me, everything in the world is, is alive. It's, it's animated. Um, I'm, I'm very interested in, in these ideas of metamorphosis, transformation, kind of... Um, I admit it, it is kind of like a mystical quality to it, but it's also very scientific in that uh, everything is always being transformed. All matter is being transformed. So I, I don't necessarily see this as an image of life and death. I see it as life in death and death in life. And um, so I, I am particularly focused um, on this idea of metamorphosis and, and transformation. Um, Next. Uh, so this next image is called Star Eater, and that actually points, you know, to, to this idea of um, uh, the, the, the story that I heard one time is that um, um, all elements are created in stars, all the elements of life, all the elements throughout the universe are created um, in this unbelievable heat of, of stars. And I remember my, my grandmother told me one time, you know, I me mean, how we, we, we eat the sun. When we eat things, we're, it's like we're eating the sun. And I was like, yeah, yeah, it's like when you eat an apple, the apple's over there and you're over here. Or not when you eat it, when you're looking at it, it's over there and you're over here. 
most people think of things like apples as inert or, or, or dead, or at least not alive, and people as alive. But then you eat the apple and it becomes you. And then where, where's, the, where's the apple? Just, just that act of, of eating and knowing that that apple exists because of the energy from the sun and that we ourselves are made of elements that, that come from the sun and, and other stars is just, it's such a fantastic idea to me. It's so inspiring and incredible. And uh, that, that very idea um, kind of fuels um, a lot of the images that, that, I, that, that I make, a lot of the pictures. Um, next, please. So here's a, an image of, it, it looks like tr literal transformation. There is a, a log that appears to be turning into a human hand and each finger appears to be um, sprouting branches upon which sit all, all of these birds. Uh, so e even though I didn't know this image was gonna come out this way, uh, I know my paintings often look like um, I had a lot of sketches and I had everything um, thought out ahead of, ahead of time because there, there's a certain pre precision to them. Uh, it, it, it isn't so. Things move around. I add things. I take things out. Uh, it, I, I often am not sure what I'm going to do, um, but the act of painting and the act of making the images is you, you enter into a kind of conversation with the image. It, it suggests Sometimes I'll, I'll I'll start out with something and it suggests marks or it suggests the next the next step to take, and that was certainly the case with with this image, but it it does um, align with the, the larger theme of metamorphosis and transformation and the self the uh, the, the molecules of each of us having been. Um, uh, composed, have, having composed the bodies of other maybe living creatures. Uh, well, I mean, again, everything to me is alive, but it could have been things that we think of as inert. So in this, it's kind of a literalization of this idea. This, And, and it's, I, I titled it Reach because it's kind of an, a reach for us in our, um, um, the, 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 the short spans of our lifetime to, to think about, to, to really imagine that. But when you think about the long, you know, long, long spans of time, um, uh, matter is always undergoing uh, transformations. Right, next, please. Uh, murmur here again. It uh, there's a a um, a kind of composition that I I uh, often use uh, an entity that it's made up of. That, that appears to be one thing, but it's made up of many, many other things. So this little figure is, in the middle is made up of a tooth, um, some stems, a seed, a wishbone, and, and other objects tied, tied together to create a kind of stick figure of a, of a human. Uh, and then surrounded, again, by the crown or, or a halo of, of these objects. And for me, the, the tying together acts as a kind of me metaphor to talk about how we are all um, tied together, entangled, part of, in relation with um, our environment, everything around us, uh, the natural world, other people, ideologies, uh, the, the, the matrix of you know, so social and, and economic and political and material um, um, conditions that we live in. Uh, so the this this is barely a body, <laughs> um, but I think it would be recognized as a body. So for me, it's it's the body, um, but we we don't create ourselves. We're not self generated. We we emerge out of particular conditions, and we are in relation to those conditions all the time. So for for me, that's the kind of theme that that I have in mind um, for for a painting like this. Uh, next, please. Um, so it, here, uh, there's not really acts of transformation. These are, um, objects for, for me, very beautiful objects, um, flowers, mushrooms, um, animals, and so on. Um, and if, if you look closely, you can see everything is tied together and then being held up very precariously 
a one tiny um, little hook. So the uh, the feeling of weight and the fact that this this could break, the string could break, and I'll fall down at at any, at any moment. Um, is is what I was going for in this image. Um, uh, obviously, we we are living at a time of great um, precarity um, in you know a lot, lot of realms in in the world. But a lot of people are thinking about climate change and what what can be lost. Uh, so ev that's sort of in the in the back of my mind. Um, but also in the back of my mind in doing this image is the fact that you know, the world has ended for a lot of people, like during colonization, the entire worlds came, came to an end. Um, but there, there's uh, a strength in, in surviving. And so for me, I wanted to put the emphasis on the, the kind of fecundity, the, the, uh, the lusciousness of, of these objects, even though they are, they are quite precariously balanced on, on this one little hook. Okay, next, please. Uh, anatomy lesson. So here's an, another skull <laughs> sur surrounded by um, natural objects. Um, I mean, for, for me, all of these, mo most of the pictures that I make um, are referring to some aspect of experience, you know, embodied experience. So even though I may not uh, image a person, for me, as I said before, uh, the 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 body is is very implied. It's, it, uh, so here is very much like, like royalty, um, a kind of connectedness, a sort of connectedness between objects that that may at first hand seem. Um, dead and objects that seem alive. And I, for this painting in particular, I was hoping to get across this like like really trippy feeling, like a, a kaleidoscope almost um, in the way uh, it's there's mirrors both from the top and the bottom and from from left to right. Okay, next please. Uh, when, when I was you. Uh, this is actually a print. Uh, it's a, um, a seven color print uh, that I made with some master master printmaker. So I, I drew this on a stone and the printmakers um, pr printed it. It's a really complex um, process, uh, not usually what I do, but I'm, I'm really interested in, in, in technique, in how an image you know, gets made, like all the, um, the, the particular colors that are used and the kind of paper and the kind of brushes and, and all that, that kind of thing. So it was really, it, it was a great process. Um, but what I was thinking here is, so if, if you can see on your screen, it may be a little hard to read, but this is an iris that appears to have been torn apart and then carefully sewn back together. Uh, and there are the, the thread, the, the red thread is kind of streaming down um, from, from some of its, its petals and, and being held up. Uh, so I think when some people look at this, it, it looks uh, that they emphasize the kind of broken quality of, of the iris. But for, for me, um, the fact that it's, that it's been repaired and is still um, beautiful and and still there, uh, still in, intact in, in a way. Repaired was broken, but repaired is for me what comes across the most. And um, uh, this has reference for me. It references uh, people, people that I know, people that I know, particularly ancestors, um, whose I mean, my life is very easy compared to theirs, and. Uh, when I think about some of the um, um, traumas and terrors they went through, uh, I, I, I can just hope that I can be as strong as them and, and you know, imagine myself still intact in, in, in spite of, of what, whatever um, comes my way. Okay, next, please. Uh, this is my knowing. So, uh, <laughs> I worked on this painting for like 10 years. <laughs> uh, and that is because I kept changing it. Um, the, the bones were not always in that pattern. Uh, the little, the central heart, 
uh, which is this like you know, gl little glistening heart, uh, was a number of, of objects. Um, it was just never quite right. I would have to keep sanding parts of it off and going back in and, and repainting them. Uh, and you know, a lot of paintings are like that. Uh, you 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 enter again into this kind of relationship with this image that, in some ways, makes itself because of the way um, it it seems to offer ways to move or it offers suggestions to 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 me. Uh, but the 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 idea behind this, um, what what I wanted to get across is. Uh, that there's a, a story. So you know how we are all categorized when we, you know, we're we're born new into the world, but the world's really old. And uh, depending on your embodiment, um, you know, if you have a disability, depending on your skin color, depending on your class, depending on all kinds of stuff, you will get categorized in particular ways depending on the society around you. And what one of the ways I remember as, as a very young person um, uh, uh, sort of rebelling against or, or not liking was how some people are categorized as rational and other people are categorized as emotional. Uh, and uh, I, I, I love how uh, now there's all this writing um, about how that that's nonsensical to think about a rational person and an emotional or or a rational decision and an emotional decision. It's all one thing. It's it's all in that there are no emotional centers of the brain. It, it's all it's all together. Um, so this idea again of trying to make a a um, simultaneity, the idea that each of us is a rational and emotion and emotional creature. Uh, so this I, this was this was just my kind of like pushing back on this idea of, of for a variety of reasons having been categorized in a particular way that yeah the, this this is the way I know the world through my body um, and and we do we we often um, can't articulate um, everything that we're feeling or, or or knowing a lot of what we know and a lot of what our body knows never even rises beyond rises uh, beyond the threshold right rises to the threshold of consciousness but our bodies know um, our bodies know a lot uh so th this was a the, the image the picture i came up with uh, as a way to try to communicate you know that that sensation you know that that feeling that that yes one can know a lot about the world and about oneself um through one's body or through through one's emotions as well. Okay, next. Uh, this is the final picture that that I have, uh, divining rod, uh, and th this came from a real simple, uh, like the simple feeling of that that comes from. Uh, you know, we're all trying to navigate through the world, trying to navigate through social sphere and and, and everything else, and we are often not very well equipped <laughs> to do that because the world changes all the time. And, um, uh, you know, we, we get older things. I mean, things happen and you often in our lives, things happen once, like we, we age once we, we have, I mean, a lot, a lot of stuff doesn't happen to us over and over and over again. We kind of have like one chance to, to live through it. So this this is just came from that feeling of both taking great pleasure in um, in the day to day and day to day life and discovering and feeling kind of feeling you know your way through something, but also the inevitable pain that comes from making mistakes and not knowing and 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 that those sorts of things. Uh, so I have um, I, I hope it's it's readable. It's like these two gloved gloved hands that that in this odd way you know come together um and i thought that that looked like a divining rod you know something that you're you're using um you know to try to find water it, it it's a guide it's it's you're, you're you're depending on it to get you through to get to have so you survive um whether those things work or not i i, I don't i don't know um, but that's all we got. That, that's what we have. We have our, our ourselves and our, and our senses of um, 
uh, you know, to get through the world and 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 to do to to thrive in the world. Thanks, Maria. I, I'm I'm struck by your work in how you deal so much with death and brokenness, but every work feels so alive. Um, and I also really love how there's this um, there's a relationship with the work, but it to the body, but it's much more intangible, and so. I wonder what challenges you run into when trying to articulate the relationship between the body, between the mind and the objects that you include in your work. Yeah, that, I mean, that's something that I think a lot about and um, I sort of alluded to it er earlier where, uh, I mean, things, the world has changed a lot. As, as a very young woman, um, I heard a lot that there was a, a, a split between the mind and the body, these were two. These were two different spheres of existence. Your 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 mind was one thing, your body was another thing, and then the other thing was the world outside your body. You know this idea that you yourself end at the surface of your skin, um, but that never seemed right to me. So I've made paintings that kind of resist that idea, and. Uh, you know, as I said, a lot of times when I sit down to make a picture, I don't exactly know what I'm going to do. Um, but I remember hear, hearing or reading about how um, uh, this one writer goes about um, making, making stories or, or actually writing essays. And he also said, I'm not sure, I'm not sure what I think about a thing when I sit down to write an essay. Writing the essay is the process of thinking through this idea through the writing, I come to understand what I think about whatever subject this person was writing about. And I remember when I read that, I thought, yeah, that, that's kind of what making pictures is like for, for me anyway. <laughs> Sometimes I'm not sure what I'm going to say or what I want to say. I have, I have a sense, I have, you know, the themes that, that, I, that I work with often. Um, but until I've made the picture, I'm not, not really sure. <laughs> so, um, so get, getting back to this idea of, of like these being three separate spheres, there's the, the body, the mind, and then um, the world outside of you or objects outside of you. Uh, I, I mean, I think a lot of people have now accepted that um, there is no split between your mind and your body. We, we are one singular perceptual organ, you know, our, our minds and our body, very, very connected. Um, but there's these philosophers that, that go further than that. <laughs> that philosophers, I, I really like them. One of them's David Chalmers and the other one's Andy Clark. And then, then there's others, but I really like what they say. For, for them, um, it's not just, a, you're not just mind, body together, but you're also, you, you your consciousness yourself also depends on the, your, the environment you're in. So if you think about it as like, if you if you're going to think about something or experience something, we don't we don't we don't exist in a vacuum. There's something to experience. There's something to think about. There's something to navigate through. So they have this idea that this is all kind of connected in terms of how you know what consciousness is and how we come to consciousness and 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 that sort of thing. So. Uh, um, in the pictures that I make, I try to find ways to get that sort of feeling, that that sensation across, often by having things intertwined or tied together or growing out of each other or, you know, in some way like a single entity made up of lots of other smaller entities. Um, so so that's kind of how I, how I think about that, the, yeah. the, the relationship between body, mind, object, you know, or environment. And, and again, um, while I might not actually make images of, of people, although they're kind, of, they're kind of creeping in, you know, cre creeping in at, at to um, re recent work, um, I hope that uh, the, the body or, or the self or the, you know, the perceiving self is, is strongly, I hope, implied in, in the images. Yeah. And going back to your earlier comment too, right? By when you're eating the apple, you're eating the sun, right? So there's this idea of this sort of circular thing that everything is connected to, you know? 
Thank you, Maria. All right. Um, so this is actually a nice transition moving to Melissa. So Melissa's going to bring us back um, probably a little bit more intimately into the body itself. Uh, her work, uh, which you'll see on this first slide here, uh, is in the exhibit. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll let you talk about it, Melissa. All right. Well, I first want to say thank you to uh, Brian and Mike for opening up their collection with the community. I really appreciate that. And uh, thank you to GBSU for having me and to Joel for organizing this and for Maria too. So thank you all. Um, so the first image, uh, the image that's part of uh, the collection is called Fairy Tales End at Midnight. And this piece was created in 2009. And um, back then there was a very strong performative aspect of my drawings. So a lot of the drawings were being inspired and formed by my life and my relationships. And I think there was like a relatively emotionally charged component to it. So this piece was um, kind of taking that trope of imagining like, hanging out at a party really late, passing out on the couch and perhaps people drawing on you with a Sharpie. So, um, you know, there's a moment of vulnerability of being take, taken advantage of in that action. And so in a way, this was my reclaiming that. So what I did is I had a friend of mine draw on my face with a Sharpie marker and, um, and then I photographed it after I slept on it uh, throughout the night. So if you notice the forehead is kind of like greasy and smeared, that's because, you know, half of, half of that skull ended up on my pillow in the process of sleeping. So um, there was this really performative aspect. So, um, and the other reason that I was really interested in doing this is I've always kind of been interested in um, the act of drawing, of mark making, and um, kind of its relationship to realism. And so I liked the challenge of drawing, drawing images that were drawn on the flesh and then kind of part of the flesh. So things kind of integrate with wrinkles and with grease on the face, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so let's do the next slide. So this is a follow-up image to that piece. So um, in 2009, a lot of the performative aspect had, um, I think an element where I would kind of respond and be open to what came of the process. So um, when I had my friend draw on my face, uh, I was actually working at the front desk of the art university at UW-Madison. And so I had to prepare for work and I was kind of like frantically trying to rub off all of the Sharpie marker so that you know I could look presentable at the desk. And uh, when I looked in the mirror, I thought that you know this had kind of the stirring kind of image of you know someone kind of coming up from the ashes being covered in it, it felt almost like a like a, a, a war paint or something. Uh, so this one's called It's All Over Your Face. So essentially directly related to the previous piece. Um, but it was made in 2010. So kind of within a couple of months. Um, how about the next slide? Um, so I thought it would be helpful to know a little bit of how these drawings are made. So I took a little photo of my um, palette. So these drawings are made out of powdered graphite. So you can see on the stool, there's like just this little cluster of dark flakes. That's the powdered graphite. It comes in what looks like a peanut butter jar. And then I dust it on with various brushes. Um, I had the same brush from 2008 until about 2020. Um, and at that point it like gave up broke in half and I figured out that makeup brushes are perhaps the best replacement to my most beloved brush that, you know, RIP is done for. Um, so uh, the process of this is I dust uh, powdered graphite on with brushes, anything soft, and then I erase away details. So it's this very additive subtractive process. And when I was doing these drawings in 2009, a lot of them were about relationships and you know, things I was trying to process. 
Um, so the act of drawing helped me work through a lot of those feelings and a lot of those kind of events as like someone in their mid twenties was uh, going through. So Melissa, you alluded to this already um, a little bit that the work's very performative, at least this work in particular, the one that's in the show and this last one that you showed us. Um, so I've got a quick question for you. How does your experience living in your own body impact your choices as an artist? Right, let's do the next slide. It'll give a little insight. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, as I said, a lot of my drawings are very inspired by um, my life and my relationships, my environment, kind of, um, I, I take a lot from what's around me and my experience. So um, in 2011, 2012, I moved to Brooklyn, to New York. So I went from being like a Midwest girl to uh, being in Brooklyn. And so my sense of self really shifted. I went from Madison where I felt like I could be performative to all of a sudden being one of millions of people. So that sense of self, especially the sense myself and the world really shifted. And so I um, started to think about um, ways of still using the body, but putting it in a, into a different context where um, the body became either abstracted, part of a landscape, um, kind of ab abstracted in various ways. So this is a series um, back in my Brooklyn studio called Plunge. And so um, this was inspired by, you know, going home after a long day working in New York. And the only quiet place I could find was in the tub because even in the, con the apartment building, there'd still be all of this noise in the city. It was just always this intense energy that was like lovely to feed off of, but sometimes you need a respite. So I would go into the bathtub and it would be like kind of my connection to the lakes that I used to live by in, in the Midwest. So um, I took this uh, series of photographs that I ended up translating into these large scale drawings that um, combine the figure with water and bubbles. And there's kind of this element of either sinking or rising, kind of like this push and pull. Um, but I also liked the, the ability that I had um, to get more abstracted in my mark making. So I've always had this impulse ever since I was young to be as kind of uh, uh, tight and photorealistic. Like I've always been drawn to photos and um, rendering. And so I liked the challenge of things like bubbles and waves where you could actually see with that process of the powdered graphite, a lot of the marks are made by erasing away. So those bubbles and the waves gave me that space and kind of that freedom to kind of loosen up a bit. So how about the next image? So this is just a zoom in in one of those drawings. So these are all about 50 by 50 inches. So they're relatively large. This one's called Drift. So this was made in 2012. Next. Um, so the follow up to this series, I was again thinking about ways of abstracting the figure, but still referring to the figure. So with this series, um, it was all, um, again, photographed in my bathroom, uh, but this was uh, yogurt that I had put food coloring in until it matched my skin color. And the initial idea was kind of pouring this yogurt over my head as an act of kind of concealing myself, taking myself out or perhaps like, um, yeah, a way of like making myself into a site, perhaps a landscape. Um, and then when I looked at the images and kind of re reviewed them, I also realized that all of these liquids have a very uh, corporeal feeling, like they feel like they're from the body or of the body. You know, there's a sensual like liquidy aspect to it. Um, also very fun to draw. So this one's called Washed Out. Next one. All right, so uh, for a while after that series, um, the figure took kind of a back seat because in New York, I was doing a lot of things that were referencing still lifes that I found around the city. Um, and I was doing some wheat paste posters and whatnot. 
And then I came and I moved to Minneapolis and all of that graffiti did not exist here at that point. Um, and uh, so I had to pivot. So what's interesting about being, what I kind of enjoy about being inspired by my environment is every time either my person or my environment shifts, it's like a challenge to almost reinvent myself with my work. Um, so after moving here, I became a mom. And so as after that transition, the, the work got much more based in the figure again, because life had become again, very corporeal, very of the body because I was dealing with small children. Uh, so this drawing is a self portrait. <laughs> Again, in my bathroom. I didn't realize that all the images I chose were uh, located in bathrooms. But so uh, this drawing was uh, inspired by, I had uh, an artist talk that I had to give. Uh, I had some collectors to my house. I had my sp small kiddo who was probably six months old. I felt like I was like balancing it all and doing well and conveying my ideas. And um, after the talk, one of my friends came up to me and they were like, you know, while you were talking, your kid was wiping their snot in your hair. <sighs> so it's like this moment where you're like, you think you're nailing it. And then you realize like, it's just like this grounding element of, yeah, like <laughs> life. So uh, this was, uh, I like to play with um, various forms of uh realism and motifs that tend to be uh, part of that uh, language of realism. So this is the kind of quintessential beautiful French braid, but instead of being perfect, it's all kind of like uh, a muck with like uh, Cheerios and random liquids dripping from it and stickers. So next one. And then um, taking it, to my most recent kind of collection of works. So I've been thinking about uh, ways to reference the figure without having the actual body present. So I've been really, uh, I love drawing hair. I love that, again, that hair, almost like the bubbles and the water and the waves, it affords me kind of this freedom where my mark can be present and perhaps um, not as self-conscious. So it, it lets me be, uh, have a little bit of freedom. So my idea with drawing hair and um, objects that reference the figure is hopefully I can break more from my reliance on photos and use more still life components and also be inspired by things just straight out of my brain. So uh, we'll see how it pans out. But this one's called The Lookout. Uh, it was created kind of, a year into the pandemic where I was like uh, going a little bonkers having two small children. <laughs> and so this is my hair with a googly eye. I kind of felt like it encapsulated my feelings. <laughs> next, and then uh, the next image is what's currently behind me. So again, those elements of the figure hair. So this is my kiddo's hair um, and then kind of things that represent either them or um, their personalities. And so I'm gonna see how that kind of evolves, like representing people without the person actually depicted. And that's that. So Melissa, I've got a, a question that just kind of came to mind right now related to process. So you used your body early on quite a bit and you referenced the fact that you had somebody, a friend draw on you. But you were talking about like these, in some ways, the, the bathroom was really a safe space for you. Did you do all the photography of yourself or did you invite someone to do that with you? Uh, no. So they've always been photographed by me uh, with, it used to be like the DSLR camera. Um, no, it started with like a point and shoot. And then I got fancy with like the DSLR with like a little um, remote control. And now it's all iPhone photos. So... Great. Thank you. Um, so I, I have a, a question for both of you to kind of continue to, uh, the conversation. Um, Melissa, you mentioned a little bit about this, just the way you structured your talk, but I wanted to open it up to both of you too. And that is, 
Um, after we've learned a little bit about your work and some of the progression, have you changed your approach to the body in your work over your career? So for either of you. Lisa, why don't you go first? <laughs> um, well, I feel like I touched uh, on that a lot, but um, I think that, uh, so for the first few years of uh, working with powder graphite, so from about 2008 through probably 2011 or so, I was very much featured, I was essentially the subject of my own drawings. I had all of these different um, personas and characters and, you know, it was very performative again, but I, I used myself as the site of all of the action. You know, I was the photographer, I was the, the performer, and then I, you know, ended up making the drawing later. So it was like all roles were filled by me. Um, and when I moved to New York, I kind of felt like I wanted to take a back seat. And so that's why I started either sinking in the water or trying to kind of cover myself or mask myself in a way in all of these different um, kind of directions. Um, and then, you know, my sense of, of the body has really shifted kind of dependent on my relationships or the roles that I'm playing. So as a role of a mom, I feel like my life is so based in bodies and taking care of bodies um, that I, it's given me a, like a different relationship or a different outlook on that. Um, but I think formally too, I've kind of been interested in going from, you know, more of like the traditional portraiture to pushing the boundaries of what that can be and then cropping in, getting more zoomed in, letting it be more abstracted. Um, kind of playing with what a figure can can be because really it, one of the things that keeps me going is my love for drawing flesh and hair so there was a, a point when I was like in New York drawing objects and I still love drawing objects like but uh, hair and flesh is just something I, I can't get away from because I love it so much so yeah Maria um, so I, I feel like I'm moving in the opposite direction. So Melissa, you started with the body and you're like figuring out other ways to, to make a portrait, like not necessarily faith and body. And, um, when I went to school, I went to like a school that was pretty conceptual. I had no idea though. I, I didn't know anything about like uh, what I was getting getting into, I, I thought I was going to go and, and learn how to be a better technician. And it was a very conceptual school. So like painting was kind of frowned on, you know, like do, doing the body is like, mm, no, that's, you don't do that. Uh, so I had to figure out a way uh, to, to deal with the, the, the stuff I wanted to deal with without drawing the body or without imaging the, the body. But now, you know, that, that happened a long time ago. And I, I mean, you look at the art world now and it, I mean, there's figures, I mean, look at Brian and Mike's um, collection. It's uh, so many great artists um, that deal specifically, you know, with, with the figure. So I, I feel like the figure is kind of creeping in now um, maybe just a hand or, or dolls. I'm pa painting like some dolls right now. Um, uh, so I, I feel like I'm moving a little closer to dealing uh, or to actually imaging a, a figure and, and a, a body and an actual body. And it, it changes, it changes stuff. Like so, suddenly um, you're not dealing with the, the, the absent body and figuring out how to create symbols or you know a metaphoric kind of language the body's right there so it really it changes the relationship between what's imaged uh, what the objects are um, so I'm, I'm kind of having a uh, fu having fun with that and figuring out how to again navigate my way through through that well Thank you both. This has been, uh, it's been great to learn about your work uh, and uh, have you in conversation. I want to open it up now to anybody from the audience who has any questions, um, uh, either through the chat or raise your hand and I'll let Nathan filter those through. 
Um, and if anyone needs to leave, we thank you for joining our program and appreciate uh, you uh, you joining us tonight for this. We, we, we do have one question in the chat. I want to read out here from Roseanne. Um, she says, Maria, I love your vibrant lush images. Do you study natural objects or create a still life or live assemblage to study? Um, I, I do uh, draw um, natural objects. Um, when I, uh, years ago, I used to actually get the objects. You know, if I was going to draw an apple, let's say, I'd get the apple and, and paint it. But uh, it takes me so long to finish a painting, like the apple will long ago have rotted, you know, before I'm even like have to very many layers down. So um, I usually will um, use a series or back then I would use a series of, of objects. Um, and then I just started photographing and, you know, using both. So that's what I do now. And I use, use photographs and objects. Um, uh, just to see what particular, you know, like, like with Melissa, I mean, I love creating the illusion of three dimensions. I love creating the illusion of like different qualities of like the surfaces of materials, the way light reflects off some stuff. Like, man, that's just, that's juicy and it's pleasurable. It's just so much fun. Um, so and you don't, you don't really, you, you, you can, if you know how to do that and you've drawn a lot from life, you can figure out where the photograph is a co um, compressing values and where the photograph isn't giving you the information you need. So I kind of like go go back and forth between between both. Thanks. Did we have? Uh, did I see Allison? Did you have your hand raised? I did, um, but my question uh, initially was, I was wondering if Maria used still lives and how they would have <laughs> stayed <laughs> the way that they're, the end result is. But um, so thank you for answering that. And I guess it's just more of a comment, you know, when you're talking, Maria, when people, you know, ask me about how I feel about religion, for example, I'll just, you know, I, I'll make a comment like, to me, all is one. And when the way that you were talking about your art making and your concepts of the human body within our realms, you know, I felt like you put together in words so much better than what I can describe because I, that's what I end up just saying is, you know, all is one <laughs> because I don't know how to like process all the information and to, you know, share how my body feels about myself in the world. So thank you so much for that. I really appreciate your insight and thought. And I love being able to look at your images now in, um, in a way that I feel um, has just a, a deeper connection to my own humanity. So thank you for that. And also, Melissa, I just wanna say thank you for the evolution that you've taken within your drawing. Um, I think, you know, when using the the photographs as a direct relation to showing so much of your own figure, I think, you know, the biggest thing when people walk into our gallery space, the first thing they think is like, is that a photograph? And then they get up close and they read the label and they're like, oh my gosh, this is, this is not a photograph. This is amazing. Um, and so that surprise in our visitors and our students, students is really you know, it's satisfying for them to kind of be in awe and, um, you know, caught up by the, your ability to draw. But then as you continue to evolve and, and just love the realistic approach that you take to the bubbles and the hair and everything like that, um, I think it, it shows just a different dimension that you're able to do within using you know the photography and different skills that you have that your concepts have just continued to build on your skill set so I just want to thank you both so much I'm in love with everything and I love this you know, listening to you both so thank you thank you I have a couple more questions from the chat I want to get out here before six so or for before seven um for both Maria and Melissa, what is the attraction to try to depict the body through objects or elements that are not of the body? 
Thank you. You you want to go, Melissa? <laughs> um, I guess part of me is uh, I think it's multifaceted for me. Um, I always like a new challenge. I always like to kind of keep pressing and kind of uh, altering what my work is about. I want to kind of keep evolving, um, but also like uh, since again I'm inspired by my life and kind of relationships and people around me uh, I also kind of want to keep my kids private so like having objects stand in for them is a way of uh, kind of protecting them in a way um, even though I have featured them but I tend to like feature them like I drew my daughter once with a crown upside down over her face so um, it was, it had a playful element, but it also had kind of this masking element because a, a kid can say, yeah, I, I want to be part of your drawing, but what about in like years from now, will they change their mind? And then what happens, you know? So um, it's multifaceted, but like, I think really it's, it's about evolving and about like, being continually challenged by different materials and processes. And, you know, now I love drawing lace. So, I mean, that's kind of part of it too. <laughs> um, I, I, yes to everything Melissa said, absolutely. And I, I'll, I'll add another, another element. Um, uh, you know, there, there's no such thing as like a human being. Like who, who, how, how would you image that? Would, would it be like a, maybe a middle-aged like Asian woman? Would it be a old Mexican lady? you like, how, how, if you, it's when you, when you image a body, it's so particular. That body is, has, is it's a, a location of like class, experience, age, you, like all kinds of stuff is located, you know, in, in that body that you're making. And um, if you are not willing to engage with the issues that that, that brings up, may, maybe you better think about you know like a, a different way to bring up the issues surrounding being um, and and you know being in the world. Um, for, for me, that that was an issue because my, my fa you know my family is all uh, immigrants from Mexico, and I remember as when I went to college, I would I would paint that you know like people that i knew and i could just never get the conversation beyond like that kind you know like that kind of stuff I'm like no like people are individuals they're, they're not just cat they're not just no that's a total stereotypical way of thinking no you're i'm trying to say something about um material being in 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 the world and uh, relationship to you know the ideologies or, or whatever and it was really really hard for people to not keep coming back to these issues of you know sp specificity what, what was I trying to say about that um, so it sometimes doing it or at least for me symbolically um, uh, allows me to uh, tackle some of the issues I'm interested in without like con you know continually um, going back to, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in those issues too, very, very, very much issues of like race and class and, and so on. Um, it's just that, uh, that there are, there are good ways and better ways of making images to, to put, um, you know, may, maybe to, to put the audience, uh, to orient them towards the issues that you want to deal with. And so that, that's maybe one, one reason for um, trying to find other ways rather than uh, when, when you want to deal with humanity, but you don't want to talk about, you know, it, it's the specificity of the body that can get in the way. I also um, appreciated uh, when you said, Maria, talking about, you know, eating an object and that you're or eating an apple and that you're eating the sun. Like there's some really beautiful poetry, I think of those boundaries of something becoming part of you. And, and like those, uh, I guess I've, I never really thought about that continuum so beautifully where like something can be both in 
and outside of you and also alive and in the process of dying and dying in the process of living. Like that continuum, I, I'd never really thought of in such kind of uh, imagery. It's r really a beautiful idea. If I mean, if you think about it, it's like we're, I mean, I know we think of ourselves as separate, but every breath you take, you're, mm -hmm. you're snuffing up a bunch of molecules. Of yeah, I was you. just gonna. I was just gonna mention. I had a. I have a, a, a friend of mine who's a so songwriter, and he hit. There's this beautiful lyrics that he wrote, and it was um. This dust I'm breathing in is someone else's skin. That yeah. idea, right? Like, I mean, it. You're like, oh man, that's not like that. But it's like, yeah, like everything is this cycle. That's it's symbiotic in some ways. It's true. I mean, we're, we're really porous. We're like really porous beings and the world yep. is passing through us like all the times. Um, so yeah, issues like toxicity, and, you know, all that kind of stuff then is, is really, really important because it's not outside of yourself. It's, it's it becomes part of you. Mm -hmm. um, I want to be mindful of the time. I think Nathan, you said there was maybe one other. Uh, yeah, one, one last question here. Um, this is to, um, to Melissa. Uh, Roseanne says, as a mother myself, I appreciate your evolution of practice and style balancing home life. Your range of value and contrast in your art through subject matter and technique is impressive. You said you work additive and subtractive as well. Do you heighten your art with white charcoal or Conte? Nope. Uh, it's just uh, the white is always the white of the paper. Um, and then it's just built up um, I, you know, dust on with brushes, uh, the powdered graphite. And then since powdered graphite um, sits on the surface, um, it's relatively easy to, to erase away to that white surface. So as long as it's not like that dark area, that'll never go white. Um, so I kind of have to plan it ahead of time. But yeah, only, only graphite. I don't even really use pencil. It's just brushes and erasers, so. Yeah, I think that was one of the things that was the most amazing thing about your work was discovering that you were doing this with a brush that you weren't drawing with like, uh, you know, a pencil or a stick of charcoal or something like that. It's quite beautiful. <laughs> Thanks. Um, okay, I, I, I think this is a good time to wrap up. We said some a few questions and I, um, I appreciate everybody's time. So once again, thanks to our two presenters. Uh, thank you for sharing and uh, thank everyone for joining us tonight. And if you have a chance to see the exhibit before it closes on the 4th of November, please do so. Thank you. Thank you.